Thank you. Dear colleagues, it's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation. It's nice to be here, even though, as you can see, spring has come also in Sweden. Okay, let's see if we move. I'd like to say from the beginning that you can't expect too much of data. There is very limited data still in PV and especially in ET. And also, I assume that you all are very familiar with, with ruxolitinib or with JAK2 inhibitors, the side effects, etc. So I will not repeat such things. Let's start with polycythemia vera then. The first study that was published was an open label study of this particular JAK2 inhibitor with 27 PV patients and uh, some ET patients as well. It was rather a special study because it was designed uh, specifically to detect a 15% reduction of JAK2 in mutation allele burden. There were no clinical endpoints. So the only question was, does it reduce the allele burden more than 15%? And the answer was simple, no. There was no significant redu reduction in the JAK2 allele burden. As you notice now, um, this was a very short study, only 6 to 18 weeks. So from what we know now, you couldn't really expect any change in the JAK2 allele burden. Anyway. There came new studies, and this was the first one with ruxolitinib. Um, it's an open dose finding phase two study. In patients who are inel ineligible to hydroxycarbamide, but judged by the physician, the treating physician, not by any speci specific uh, characteristics. Um, 34 patients, treatment for 35 months. And here is in brief the results. Um, complete remission, hematocrit below 45 without phlebotomy, platelet count below 400, white blood cell count below 10, and normal spleen. Um, and as you can see, the red line there, complete responses were actually reached in about 60% of the patients. Um, these results are much better than later results. Um, may have had to do with the inclusion criteria, with the ineligibility to hydroxycarbamide judged by the treating physician. So later, it was encouraging, of course, these results. So then was um, the response trial started, which is a randomized open-label phase three study in PV patients. Um, phlebotomy dependent with splenomegaly measured by MRI or CT and resistance or intolerance to hydroxycarbamide. And uh, the two arms had about 110 patients in each. And you can see in the standard treatment arm, actually 60% of the patients were in the study treated with hydroxycarbamide. And after Dr. Kilagian's talk, I think you may be rather surprised to see that only 11% were treated with interferon. I will come back to that. Anagrolide is almost as much as interferon when, as you know, anagrolide is used in PV only when there is an excess of, of platelets that need reduction. The endpoints were, the composite endpoint was uh, a control of hematocrit and a reduction of the spleen. And as you can see, only about 20%, 21% of the patients had such a response. And if you break it down into spleen reduction or hematocrit control, the figures are better. You have a response rate of 38% for spleen reduction and about 60% for hematocrit control. Here's uh, an interesting result. The patients who were responders in terms of hematocrit how long time did it take for them again to need uh, a phlebotomy? And as you can see there, the need of phlebotomy starts to, in, to come back again around 50 weeks. Um, and uh, not more than 
less than 20% of the patients actually get, um, have a need for phlebotomy. The follow-up of this uh, study at week 80 was first shown in an abstract at EHJ last year, but has now very recently been published as well. And you can see here that of the 98 patients who continued raxolitinib at week 32, almost 90% had no phlebotomy between weeks 32 and 80. So the green panel is the patients is the first weeks, 8 to 32, and the blue is 32 to 80. And the results then in the responders um, was very good. And you can see that there is a, a good chance of keeping the response for a long time in those who did respond. Other effects, a complete hematologic remission was rather rare, only 24% of the patients. And the dejective allele burden was reduced with 12% at week 32, and the maximum reduction was reached at week 111, 34% reduction, so a moderate reduction. Here is an interesting um, poster from ASH 2014, and it's a bit complicated. I'll try to take you through it. Um, the dark blue is patients who had responded with regard to hematocrit. The light blue are those who did not respond. But what the graph shows is the patients who had more than 50% reduction <coughs> in the symptom score at week 32. So what it actually shows is that it doesn't matter whether they had responded in hematocrit. They had the same response with, in regard, with regard to symptoms as the responders. And that goes for all the various clusters, uh, uh, symptom clusters. And here are the symptoms with especially high responses, uh, fatigue, itching, and night sweats. But there are some comments to make to this study. First of all, this PV population is a very unusual one. Uh, the patients are advanced. To find those with those inclusion criteria, um, you will have a, a very sp small part of the PV population, a few percent. There was a low frequency of complete hematologic remissions. And the best available treatment in the control arm comprised actually 60% with the same treatment that they had already failed, hydroxycarbamide. And only 11.9% got interferon. The criteria for response were not the ELN criteria, but this, you know, hematocrit and spleen together. And there, was, there were no bone marrow, so we don't know anything about what happened in the bone marrow. In contrast, there is this study, also shown at ASH 2014, which is different with regard to inclusion criteria. These were patients who were not uh, resistant or intolerant to hydroxyurea. They had a stable dose of hydroxyurea, but they did report symptoms, and then they were randomized. And the thing is that there was no significant difference in terms of symptoms between the raxolitinib arm and hydroxyurea. So the reason is probably the inclusion criteria. Here were patients who were uh, not intolerant or, or um, resistant to hydroxycarbamide, but rather they had good effect of it, but there were still symptoms. And only by breaking down into a subgroup uh, analysis, you can see that patients with a baseline total score of symptoms less than two had a significant uh, difference between the groups, whereas those who had a total score of above two was not uh, significant. So my conclusion from the JAK2 inhibitor studies in PV is that there is a significant difference to best available treatment, but it's only shown in selected advanced patients. In general, the effects are similar to uh, the effects in myelofibrosis, the symptomatic effects dominate over disease control. 
And the endpoints, spleen reduction and hematic control, do really not tell the whole story because the symptom relief was the same for the patients who were non responders in terms of hematocrit. The responses were also durable. Then we switch to ET, and we need to remember a few facts about ET. First of all, the survival is close to normal in true ET, as you also saw in Professor Barbui's presentation. Very few patients with ET are heavily symptomatic, and transformation to myelofibrosis is rare in true ET. But it is usually a transformation, either ongoing or already um, a real transformation to myelofibrosis that is the cause of heavy symptoms. So here's another study from 2006 showing the survival in true ET, which is very close to the expected survival for a normal population. There are only two published papers, and they are actually case reports. A couple of ET patients from the response study uh, and one special case of alopecia. I will have no time to show those. And then we have the abstract from 2014. And there is um, the pacrinitib study, but there, is, there are no details on the results in ET. So this one then is an opal label, phase two study, dose finding study with expansion. And uh, the patients are refractory or intolerant to hydroxycarbamide. Again, 39 patients. And most of them had platelets about 600. Only four patients had a palpable spleen and the symptom burden uh, is really not reported. So in terms of efficacy, we look first at the platelet response. As you can see, they started with a median above 800, and they go down, but they don't go down to below 400. Uh, it stabilizes, but you can see that after in this, this time, only 10% are complete responders, and it's no better all the way over here, it's only 13. Below 600, the figures are better. But one would say this is a rather moderate uh, response in terms of platelets, and platelet reduction is the goal of treatment in ET. Only four patients had spleen, and they all responded with more than 50% reduction. And then symptoms was, of course, the, the main item here in this study, but we know surprisingly little about this. Um, here is a graph showing patients who had symptoms over zero, more than zero on a 10 grade scale, but there is no median given and no number of patients, so we don't know neither the number of patients with symptoms nor the severity of those symptoms. So the graph tries to show here in light green patients who had a 50 to 100 percent reduction of symptoms, in dark green a 100 percent reduction. Um, but you know, 100% reduction may be from 2 to 1, or it may be from 4 to 2, or 8 to 4. We really don't know, since the figures are not given. Uh, so this tells rather little about uh, the symptom reduction uh, in ET. Other effects, white blood cell response. Uh, 11 patients had white blood cell count, about 10 at baseline. And in week 192, eight patients were below 10. Um, so a fair amount of patients went from above 10 to below 10. But then, you know, white blood cell reduction is not an accepted treatment goal in ET. Remember that in the Ipset thrombosis uh, score, uh, white blood cell count is not a factor. And the the chosen limit, 10, is uh, really arbitrary. Other effects, the jack to allele burden was a median of 24 to start with, and you have the median change after 6, 12, and 48 months. Uh, after 12 months, really no change at all, which is surprising, and after 48 months, of a moderate change. And then we come to hemoglobin and hematocrit. And you remember that hematocrit was controlled in the PV patients, in 60% of the patients. Here's another uh, poster from the same study, the response study, showing hematocrit over time in PV. Now if we, and here of course in PV, this is what you want. 
You want to get a control of the hematocrit and you want to lower it. But what about DT? Here is um, um, the hemoglobin curve uh, in ET. And here I would rather say this is a, a safety issue. They start, as you can see, almost at 140, and they go down uh, under the limit for female uh, anemia, 120, most of the patients. And then they go up a little bit and stabilize. But I like to point out that actually during, sorry, reverse. During almost a year, uh, so many patients are anemic. And there were oh, 14 men around, uh, by, uh, among them. Then it goes up a bit and stabilizes, but it still stabilizes at a level where uh, quite a few of the patients are anemic. So in, in ET, it's not a wanted effect, it's rather a side effect. And then there's the question, does JAK2 inhibition reduce thrombosis? And my judgment is that prospective studies are too small and too short to give an answer to that question because the event rate is so low. Um, but it's reported that low event rates have been seen and there's been an, an attempt at a meta-analysis recently published um, which says that there is a significant difference. I have a bit of problem to understand how uh, that conclusion is reached. We need to remember, especially now when we talk about ET, that it is highly immunosuppressive. We have known for some time that there are some uh, infections that you can see in, in patients, and recently there are other unusual infections that have been seen um, in regard to raxolitinib treatment. So for ET, I will repeat that, first of all, ET has an excellent survival, and to show an increased survival in a disease with a more or less normal life expectancy will be very difficult. Few patients have severe symptoms, and most of them are either already transformed or on the way to transform to myelofibrosis. So the risk-benefit and cost-benefit ratio is especially crucial in ET. And I think that the, the focus should really be on severe symptoms. And then we may mostly have to do with uh, patients who are uh, on their way to or already myelofibrosis. So for future studies, I really hope that best available therapy as a comparator should not be an already failed therapy. And it's sort of a crazy situation, especially for PV, where some countries have for years had interferon, long-acting interferon as first-line therapy. And still in a study like this, only 11.9% of, of the patients uh, are on interferon as best available th treatment. Uh, due to the limitations in availability and also in uh, whether the patients uh, have to buy, um, buy it themselves. Also, I think that in studies with um, ET, you need a, a careful diagnostic workup because the patients with severe term symptoms may very well already have uh, myelofibrosis. So I thank you for your attention. <laughs>